know a lot about it. And uh, there's no explanation for how this complex molecular machine was ever produced by a Darwinian mechanism. 150 years ago, scientists did not know about irreducibly complex molecular machines. Yet Charles Darwin anticipated the difficulty that systems such as these could pose to his theory. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. There are really two big questions in biology. How do you get new living forms with new structures like wings and eyes from life that already exists? And secondly, how did life originate on Earth in the first place? Now, of course, we know that Darwin spent most of his life formulating an answer to the first of these two questions. Charles Darwin compared the history of life on Earth to a great branching tree. The base of the tree represented the very first living cell, and the branches were new and more complex life forms that had evolved over time from the first primitive organism. Darwin was trying to explain how the branches on the tree of life originated. He was trying to show how natural selection could have modified existing organisms to produce the great diversity of plant and animal life that fills the earth today. But when it came to the base of the tree, which represented the origin of the first life, the first living cell, Darwin had very little to say. In fact, in The Origin of Species, he didn't even address the question of how life might have originated from non-living matter. The only glimpses we have of Darwin's opinions on the subject appear in a letter he wrote to a colleague named Joseph Hooker. Regarding the first production of a living organism, if, and oh what a big if, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, and electricity present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes, at the present, such matter would be instantly devoured. But this may not have been the case before living creatures were formed. During the final years of his life, Darwin did little to develop his idea that a primitive cell might have emerged from simple chemicals in the primordial waters of the early Earth. But later in the 1920s and 30s, a Russian scientist named Alexander Oparin formulated a detailed theory about how this could have happened. It was called chemical evolution. Oparin thought that he could explain the origin of the first life using Darwinian principles. He envisioned simple chemicals combining and recombining to form larger molecules, and then these larger molecules organizing themselves with the help of chance variations and natural selection into the first primitive living cell. Over the next three decades, Many scientists worked to develop and refine these ideas as they pondered the questions both Oparin and Darwin had raised. How could life have evolved from simple chemicals? 
Since the 1950s, many scientists have felt that they could simulate chemical evolution, the kind that might have happened on the early Earth. And what they're trying to do is to take simple chemicals and put them together to form amino acids. These amino acids are actually chemical compounds. Twenty different types of amino acids are common in living organisms. They comprise about half the dry weight of every cell. Amino acids are the building blocks of larger molecules called proteins. And proteins are the primary components of every cell that has ever existed on the Earth. Proteins have a wide range of function in the cell, everything from structural requirements in terms of scaffolding of the cell, the cytoskeleton, to enzymes. Proteins do all the day-to-day -day jobs inside of the cell, making energy, moving things around, cleaning up the cell. And the earliest cells had to have those same proteins because they needed those same jobs done. So the proteins in the earliest cell and the proteins today were of the same type of complexity. Scientists realize that the complex structure of protein molecules are keys to understanding how life on Earth began. By the 1960s, scientists had determined that even simple cells are made of thousands of different types of proteins. And the function of these molecules derives from their highly complex three-dimensional shapes. The irregular shapes of some proteins allow them to catalyze or trigger chemical reactions because of the hand and glove fit that they have with other molecules in the cell. While other protein molecules form interlocking structural components. The individual parts of a bacterial motor, like this ring structure, are each made of either a single protein molecule or an assembly of proteins fitted together into a specific shape. These proteins consist of one or more chains containing hundreds or thousands of individual amino acids. Biologists have compared the 20 different amino acids used to build protein chains to the 26 letters of the English alphabet. Alphabetic letters can be arranged in a huge number of possible combinations, and it's the sequential arrangement of the letters that determines whether you have meaningful words and sentences. If the letters are arranged correctly, you'll get meaningful text. But if they're not arranged correctly, you'll get gibberish. And the same principle applies for amino acids and proteins. There are at least 30,000 distinct types of proteins, each made of a different combination of the same 20 amino acids. They are arranged, like letters, to form chains, often hundreds of units long. If the amino acids are sequenced correctly, then the chain will fold into a functioning protein. Proteins are arranged in such a way that their amino acids collapse on one another and form an architecture that's pre-programmed by the hundreds of amino acids along the protein chain. So the order of those amino acids inside of a protein is essential to getting the right shape. This arrangement is critical. For if the amino acids are incorrectly sequenced, a useless chain forms, and instead of folding into a protein, it will be destroyed in the cell. As science reveals the intricate construction of proteins, origin of life researchers are confronted with a difficult question. Could amino acids floating in a primordial ocean have arranged themselves into protein molecules through purely random interactions? Obviously, it is very difficult to imagine how in the primordial oceans, the amino acids could organize themselves one after another into the right sequence to form even the simplest protein. And a good way to think about this is to think about the English language and how difficult it would be to string together a meaningful English sentence by randomly placing the letters one after another. As an illustration, consider the difficulty of forming just one line of Shakespeare's play, Hamlet, by dropping Scrabble letters randomly onto a tabletop. Only one of 26 possible letters will work correctly at each of the 30 sites in the phrase. The probability of successfully assembling Shakespeare's classic line by pure chance is determined by computing 1 over 26 
to the 30th power. The result is a staggering one chance in 2,810 trillion octillion. Yet while these odds are beyond comprehension, they seem almost reasonable when compared to the probability of randomly forming just one of the simplest protein molecules known to science. The smallest proteins in nature are comprised of about 100 amino acids. These chemical components must align in specific positions along a chain. Biologists have estimated that on a planet covered by a primordial soup, filled with complete sets of all 20 types of amino acids, the time necessary to construct a functional protein of 100 units would be roughly equivalent to the oldest estimated age of the universe multiplied by 10 to the 60th power. But despite this inconceivable time frame, even if our proteins somehow correctly self-assembled, the mystery of 